It's me. Um, just a quick poll. How many people in this room came to my talk last year? Is there anyone? There's a few of you? All right. You know what happened last time. You can expect more of that. So uh, last year I ranted about ants for about 10 minutes. Um, there was some value, apparently, in the rant. So hopefully you'll find some value on this. But I guess what I'm going to try and do is keep my rant as short as possible, because my understanding, uh, whenever I talk to people about publishing, a lot of people have unique situations, and a lot of people have their own stuff going on, and, and they've got questions they might want answered. So I'm going to keep my rant limited. I've, been, I've told the people, the wonderful GCAT volunteers, to tell me to shut the hell up. And I'm going to do that, and I'm going to stop, and I'm actually going to have time to answer some questions for folks. But if we don't get through it all, if I do rant, because I, I definitely have been known to do that, um, you can always hit me up afterwards. I'll, I'll be around. Um, not too sure what my talk description said. I should have read that when I was putting this together. <laughs> um, I think that I talked about spooky skeletons in it, so hopefully that's what you're here about. Um, it's basically me ranting, uh, talking about publishing. But let's, let's, let's go. Let's get started. It's a full room. How exciting. So sorry. So that's me. Again, last year I ranted about ants. Uh, I've been doing words and pictures in general for about 13 years in games. So community management, marketing support. I now work as the publishing producer at League of Geeks. We're making two games at the same time. <laughs> there's one publishing team. It's very fun. Um, but I've worked at places like Bethesda. I've worked outside of the games industry. I've picked up a bunch of things that I'm now going to rant at you all about for the next 35 minutes. It's very exciting. Um, so. <laughs> This is my rant slide. Um, but realistically, in, in my journey of, of coming through doing publishing, doing marketing, doing community management, I will often go to whether it's the client, whether it's my boss, whatever, whatever dynamic I'm, I'm in, and I'll ask them, what's your strategy? And they'll go, oh, yeah, we've, we've got a It's a great strategy. It's an awesome strategy. We're going we're gonna to do three Facebook posts a week, and then we're going to go viral on TikTok, and then we're going to do some other stuff. And I will often inevitably go, that's not a strategy. That is a tactic. Please tell me what your strategy is. Please, God, I need to know. Um, often, um, people, once I do explain to them what a strategy looks like as opposed to a tactic, they're like, oh, yeah, no, we totally know that stuff. It's just you know, in the back of our heads. And hopefully, in the course of this talk, I actually won't tell anybody anything new. Um, I often, the way that I do talks, I, I like to kind of group the things that you already inherently, intrinsically understand in your mind and just put some categorization around it to stop the chaos. Because even though I am chaos embodiment as a person, the way that I like to work is making order out of that chaos. Um, bit of a juxtaposition, but that's OK. Um, so let's go with the psycho metaphors. Uh, wouldn't be a Kelsey talk without them. So talking about strategy versus tactic, just so we can all be super clear as much as we can. So if you're thinking about a tactic on the sports field, because I love my sports. I don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. That's fine. If you think about it as kicking the goal, a strategy would be knowing where the goal is in the first place. If you're thinking about a tactic as like Bondi Rescue, very obsessed with that show, no idea why, the lifeguards monitoring the water to make sure people don't drown, a strategy is going to be them setting the flags in the first place, understanding the currents, understanding all those sorts of things to determine that strategy of how they're going to actually stop people from drowning. If you're thinking about a strategy as a road trip, setting the destination, looking at where you're going to be going, looking at the stops maybe along the way, one of the tactics would be packing snacks. Very important tactic, but it's not the thing that you think about first. You're thinking about the road trip. This is a spooky skeleton. That's what a strategy is. Tactic's going to be the weird, flashy skin suit. <laughs> I don't know why I put that in this slide. I'm immediately repulsed by it, but that's fine. Um, so 
I think a lot of marketers tend to use jargon, and I fucking hate it, because I think that good marketing, you shouldn't need that. Good marketing, you should be able to like talk to everybody in your team, and they should intrinsically understand what it is. So there are so many different ways to talk about strategy and tactic, and I've got a bunch of agency pals, and I asked them what they thought, and they threw acronyms at me, and I nearly threw up. But what I think, a tactic is the doing plan, and a strategy is the thinking plan. It's as simple as that. You don't need to go psycho with it. No acronyms necessary. Why is it important to have a strategy, you may say? Um, I've been doing this for about 13 years, and the amount of times I've worked in teams where we've not actually had a strategy, and we've just gone from one thing to the next thing, ad nauseum until all of us fell apart and the wheels came off. Um, I would have a lot of money if there was money involved in each time that happens. <laughs> um, change is inevitable. Like There is no plan that's ever been made ever in the history of mankind that didn't fuck up somehow. Um, I'm sure I'm not allowed to swear, but I'm going to anyway because <laughs> I can't not. <laughs> Having a strategy helps you set the destination. It helps you set your thinking and your framework so that when change doesn't happen, you, it does happen, sorry, even inevitably, you're not going to be thrown into chaos. Um, it also creates the yardstick for which you're measuring success by. I think a lot of people will go, oh yeah, we're going to do this thing. And if it isn't like number one most successful thing in the world, because they haven't thought about what their yardstick is, they're going to be like, ugh, kind of sucked though, even if you were actually very successful. Um, you know, consistency is super, super important, and you can't achieve that if you don't have a framework that you're working within. So another way of putting it <laughs> is if you don't have an understanding of the GPS and what's going on, why did the gift stop? That's upsetting. <laughs> it's fine. Without, without a plan, though, the chaos is going to go mental. You, you really don't have to read that. That was like, I think it's a single sentence. Um, <laughs> and that's what you do to us when you don't have a strategy. We end up, as marketers, as community managers, as people in our publishing team, if we don't have a benchmark to be working against, we'll lose our minds because we'll just be going from one thing to the next. We'll, you know, the term headless chooks is, is really a true thing that will happen. Um, it also means that you have no way of determining what tactic is going to be better than the other. You're just going to be going from one thing to the next. Um, you know, there'll often be times at League of Geeks where, thankfully, we have a strategy, which is awesome, um, and opportunities will come our way, and there's three of us, so we really don't have a huge amount of time to be able to determine what's good, what's not. Um, and being able to put it against our strategy and our framework and go, does this align more than the other thing with what we're trying to achieve? Yes, no, okay, sick. Now we know whether we need to do it or not. So ultimately, because apparently I made this about skeletons, um, there's gonna be a lot of skeleton gifts, by the way, so I don't, I don't think anyone's afraid of skeletons, but maybe if you are, just <laughs> maybe leave. <laughs> it's, it's not gonna be good. There's a lot of them. It's like, I, towards the end, it really goes off the rails. I didn't have a strategy when I made this presentation. <laughs> so ultimately, I think from my perspective, using the analogy of the spooky skeleton, a strategy gives you your bones and your joints. And so when you do need to pivot, when you do need to shift, when you do need to change, because you will, it's going to be possible. And it's not going to kill your team. Um, very, very important. But let's talk about a go-to-market strategy, because that is why we're here. I, I was joking when I said I didn't know. Um, cool. So in terms of a top level, again, I hate marketers that just use a bunch of jargon and a bunch of words. Realistically, what you want to be achieving with your go-to-market strategy is your who, what, when, where, why. And your tactics are the how. Pretty simple, right? I think that realistically, a lot of people will try and overcomplicate this process. They're going to try and make it way more complex. They're going to use a bunch of different stuff. Realistically, all you need to do is think about your spooky skeleton <laughs> when you're trying to pull it together. Um, think about the way that they're all connected, because they often will be, and you'll be fine. You don't need to overthink it, especially when you're an indie and you're wearing multiple hats. I think that this is the best framework to be doing it. When I talk to indies, 
often they have a marketer's mind anyway. And it's, it's not so much a stretch. I think a lot of people think that it's this, you know, we've got to hire this like agency that know all the thing, these things. Realistically, you don't. If you're clever enough to run a team and run a studio and build your game, you're clever enough to work out who, what, when, where, why. Let's go, one at a time. So why is actually the feet. And if you can't, if you don't have feet, you're not gonna get anywhere very fast. So why is actually the first thing, and it's actually quite important. From my perspective, if you start with your why, if you start with what you wanna be achieving, um, that's actually gonna help you, A, create your yardstick, B, um, it's gonna help you understand what success looks like, so you're gonna be able to build your strategy around that as well. Um, Setting targets, I think a lot of particularly indie devs are very scared of doing this. Um, I don't have enough time to talk about why setting targets is actually a really important thing and there's a lot of value involved in it. Um, all I'm gonna say is like, do it, try. Um, definitely a lot of resources out there where you can kind of start building your spreadsheet and understanding your budget. But setting a target helps you understand things like how much you should spend, if you should spend, whether you need to shorten your campaign because you don't have a huge budget, whether you need to make it longer because you wanna make sure that you're getting certain things hit. Um, having some sort of uh, like actual figure next to your why, next to your target is gonna help you with the formulation of the rest of what you're doing. Um, and this is like the only wanky part of, of where I'd get. Um, helping, like when you're thinking about a marketing strategy, having an understanding of what your brand identity is, and I know that sounds heinous, but thinking about your studio, thinking about your game, thinking about who you are, thinking about, you know, the simplest way to think of it is if your game was a color, what color would it be? Um, the, the process of good marketing is distillation to its purest form. And if you can do that really well and thinking about your brand identity, it's gonna really help you make decisions moving forward. And suddenly, all those little things that you need to do along the way, it becomes a lot easier. You don't have to like answer every question if it's a mountain. All right, let's talk about the spine or your what. Um, I think that this is one of the things that people often think about, but they don't think about it from any other lens than their own. And so I would really challenge a lot of developers to start thinking about what is the pitch that a fan of my game is gonna say to their friend to convince their friend to play it? Rather than you thinking about, oh, it's like an FPS shooter with blah, blah, blah. Like that's the what, sure. But what is the product that you're trying to sell? Um, thinking about that is actually going to have a way better outcome for everything from a strategy perspective, but also when you're like putting stuff on your Steam page. Thinking about your hook, thinking about your unique selling point. Sorry, that's the only acronym I use, I swear to God. Um, thinking about why people are going to want this, to buy this game, particularly why people are going to want to buy this game over other games, because I think there's a lot of assumptions that get made that gamers are buying 30, 40, 50 games a year. They're just not like we are because we're like psychos obsessed with games and we make them every day. But the average game is buying like two or three. Maybe if they're super hardcore, they're gonna get up to 10, 11, 12. But the average market, if you're trying to go big and, and make a really commercially successful game, you need to make sure that people are making a decision about buying your game against all the other games, not just you know the ones in your demographic. What's your price point? Thinking about that is actually helpful because it helps when you're determining how you're gonna be hitting people. If your game is going to be a $2 game and it's like a short, sharp piece of, of, of really cute content, you're gonna wanna be thinking about it as an impulse buy decision. If it's a $200 VR setup, that's gonna take a lot longer for a person to make a decision. And so that's really gonna impact your strategy and how you're building it. So you don't have to be accurate with your price point. You don't have to be like, all right, it's gonna be $29.99 and it's gonna stay like that, even though it's three years from launch and we've got no idea what this game actually is yet. Like, it doesn't have to be like that, but at least having a rough idea of where it's going to land in the market is going to help you and help your, your team if you've got a marketing team. Okay, so I don't know why I did this, but I was like, I need examples. Um, <laughs> so I decided I was going to talk to you about Skeleton 8000, which is a game that I made up literally yesterday. Um, it's a roguelite first-person RPG deck builder. 
it's going to come out in 2089. Um, the mechanic, the, the unique selling point is that it's a video game that uses memes. You shoot memes at your enemies. I don't know, man. Like, I'm so sorry. Um, in terms of price point, it's actually going to get an Xbox Game Pass deal. Phil Spencer loves me personally. We're besties, and he's going to give me $700 million. It's going to be great. And then for some reason, it's going to cost $799.99 on other platforms. I don't know why I did that to myself, but that's fine. But that's a, that's a really rough and stupid example of a what. It doesn't have to be crazy. I think a lot of people, when they think about strategy, they think, oh, it's going to be like a PowerPoint presentation that goes this like 82 slides. You're going to detail everything. You really don't need that. You just need the bones and the framework of what you're going to be doing. The head. Let's talk about the head. So this permit me a rant for a little bit longer. There are so many times, and AAA are just as guilty of this as indie, where you will ask them what their target audience is, and they will say, with a straight face, gamers aged 18 to 35. That is not an audience. That is not a target demographic. If you're super, super lucky and you make a, a cult of the lamb and it goes gangbusters, sure. But a marketing strategy isn't, oh, yeah, we're going to target everybody. You need to think about the people that are going to uniquely connect with your game. You need to have an idea and a picture in your mind of the core fans that are going to be playing this game. Um, the easiest way to start doing this, if you don't innately know inside yourself who this game is for, is look at the genre of your game. Do some research. Get some insights. Have a look at the kinds of people that are playing the game. Um, I'm very lucky, obviously, at League of Geeks, we, we do surveys of the, the fans that are coming through and players that are playtesting and things like that. And so we can collect some information about stuff like that. But if you're not that lucky and you're not in that position, there's plenty of other things. There's lots of resources that you can go to. You can even just like scope it out, have a look, see, what, see what's happening, see the kinds of people that are making 20-minute long YouTube videos about, about your games or games like yours. So using the insights of the way people are playing your games and the way people are engaging with your games is the best way for you to understand your target audience. Um, I am so sick of target audiences being gender, um, as if that is some sort of insightful piece of information. Like, women. Do you know how many women there are? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> We're all very different. Um, you know, everybody does it, and it's, it's an easy shorthand, but it, it's shorthand for research you've already done in a way that you can already understand. And, and what a target audience actually is, is the behaviors and inclinations of the people most likely to purchase. So stop thinking about, oh, yeah, cool, we're going to target this game at men. No, you need to target this game at people that often really enjoy first-person shooter games, and they play a lot of those, and they're most likely to buy it. Sure, they are more likely to be men, but that's, not, that's the shorthand for the understanding of your audience. Um, the more behavior-based and the more insightful you are at this point, the better you're going to get with your marketing. Um, Gone are the days where we just go, oh, yeah, sick, we're going to put it on TV, and then we're going to put it on the back of a cereal box, and it's going to be awesome, and it's going to sell his copies. Like, now when we're doing marketing, we can be so granular with the way that we target. If we don't have very much information to go off, we're not going to, in terms of the money that we're spending, we're not going to get as much value. So it's very important. So an easy way to get granular um, that I like to use when I'm talking to people about this stuff is thinking about three levels of your fans. So people that are your core, people that are like the mid-core range, and people that are like mainstream, if you hit it big and if you're quite successful. So who is going to pick it up day one and be a super fan? Who is this the easiest sell in the world to? Who do you know like in your gut? Yep, this person's going to be obsessed with this. I love it. How do they hear about that game? Are they obsessed with Reddit? Do they spend like 80 hours a day there? Um, do they watch like three hour long YouTube analysis videos? Like getting an understanding of that's going to be really helpful for you. Um, thinking about your mid core, thinking about the people that will pick it up when they're vibing it, when other people are buying it too, when there's a lot of discourse about it. Um, the mid-core are also a way to step it up as well. You're getting a little bit broader with the way that you're looking at it. 
And your mainstream, again, not gamers aged 18 to 35. You're thinking about the kind of genre that people are interested in. And what are they doing in their day? Is there a way that you can kind of understand the behavior of those three people? And when you think about it this way, I think a lot of people feel icky about going, I don't want to like say my game is just for men because it should be for women too. Like when that's not what an audience is, that's not what a demographic is. We're thinking about the behaviors of it. So when you think about it from this way, you can kind of separate it out a little bit more and be a little bit more reasonable with the way you do it. All right. <laughs> Back to Skeleton 9000. Really regret my choices. Um, so this, this is a game that should not be made, um, first and foremost. Or maybe it should. Maybe someone's more talented than me. Um, it just appeals to people that are chronically online, though. So people that are going to pick this up are going to pick it up for a laugh. Um, they're also going to be very rich, because uh, really my price point is not great. Um, the kinds of people that are going to get into it are early trend adopters, which is something that I use a lot, um, but it is really good to think about the kinds of people that, they're the tastemakers, they're the ones that like know what's happening, they pick up the games and they talk about them before everybody else. Those are the kind of people I'm going to want to try and target because they're going to be my core audience. Um, apparently they have ADHD because they've got three different drinks on their work desk, um, and they're probably going to be younger, let's face it. Um, so when I'm looking at my competitor profiles, apparently Jacob Janurka, the guy, um, is my core audience, so people that really like people that are funny online. Um, the mid-core is Dave Oshry, for some reason, and my mainstream is, is Reddit, but like not the weird part of Reddit. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other ways I could have done that, but it was Sunday. <laughs> my strategy in general, because of the fact that I thought about my audience and because of the fact that I thought about them being like chronically online, thinking about early adopters, thinking about fads, I'm going to make sure my, my strategy of my campaign is a really short and sharp rather than this really long sustained campaign because people are going to get sick of it really quickly. It needs to be the next big thing and that's it. So no, com sorry community managers, it's not going to be a community manager game. When? So we're talking about the hands now. I don't, I, like the metaphor really ran away from me very quickly, but that's fine. Just pretend it is a really good one. Um, I think I, I talked about this earlier in terms of a roadmap, and often there'll be a push and a pull with a dev team and a publishing team about what's your roadmap, what's coming next, what's the calendar looking like, and the dev team being like, please do not talk to me for the love of God, I'm trying to make this whole damn game. Um, from my perspective, that push-pull needs to happen and is important. And I think that having a roadmap that is wrong is so much better than never having one in the first place and just kind of doing shit as it happens. Um, so please, please make a roadmap, even if it's wrong. From my perspective, phasing is a word that you might hear me say a lot. Um, and that's because you can't scream for 12 months straight. Um, you will die, everybody around you will get very annoyed, and people probably won't buy your game because they'll think of you as the weird person screaming for 12 months. Um, you want to be appealing to those three levels of people. You ideally want to appeal to lots of different behavior types. So the idea is that you'll look at your campaign and you'll go, OK, for this window of the campaign, maybe <laughs> E3. I just said E3. Wow, that's RIP. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a time in a year, let's a PC gaming show. There's, there's a big tentpole moment for games. We're going to say, hey, we're going to go there because we want to hit mainstream. And then we're going to immediately revert to our phase that's going to be very core oriented because we're not going to have the ability to sustain that mainstream. But our core will be attracted because of that cool mainstream thing that we did. And now we're going to be able to focus on them and, and messaging to them. And then maybe a little bit further on, we'll go for the mid-core. And then down towards mainstream, we're going to go right big and we're going to hit as many people as we can. The way that you can do that means that if you've got a really limited budget, you can be thinking about weighting that budget around those phases. And also, you're going to have different people when you're talking. Um, Different people are going to have different messages that you're going to need to be speaking to. And b doing a phasing campaign allows you to use a different message for each of them. And you're not just going to say the same thing over and over again. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone here knows what a marketing funnel is, but please tell me if you don't so I can explain it. Anybody not? You, no? OK, cool. I will explain it then. So sorry. Um, marketing funnel, and like, I really encourage you, just literally Google it after this talk or even during. I don't care if you're on your phone. <laughs> um, it's, it's like an inverse pyramid. And it's literally a funnel. If you think about like getting your customers in, and it's used 
like not just our industry, everywhere. And at the top, it's awareness. So that's the purpose. And you're trying to get people to be aware of your product. And then it goes down to consideration. And then it goes down to engagement. Then it goes down to ooh, something. And then it ends in purchase. And in games, we actually have an extra part of the funnel where it's like we build advocates out of those people and turn them into fans. Um, other industries do it slightly differently as well. But the idea is you want to be pouring people into that funnel. And you start with awareness. And then you move down to the crunchier end of, of considering and then buying. Um, building your go-to-market strategy around that is really fine. And I think a lot of people kind of feel like, oh, no, I don't want to do the thing that all the other marketing people do of, like, my strategy is going to be different and cool. And it's like, no, just use the funnel. It's what works. It's important. It's a really good way to kind of think about your strategy as well. Cool. Um, I, I touched on it a little bit earlier in terms of different people needing different messages. Um, they're going to also need different levels of convincing. And that's going to take a slightly different message as well. So starting with the core and working out is like a really strong strategy that a lot of people use. Um, there are AAA exceptions to this, but I don't know. I don't care about them <laughs> anymore. Um, your core are also the most likely to become advocates as well. So think about your communication pillars during your campaign that are going to help with that too. And I know like saying words like communication pillars, again, it sounds like, oh, it's a big deal. It's really not. It's just like, all right, at this point, I'm going to tell them that Skeleton 9000, actually, I've got an example. Skeleton 9000 is the best, most cool new thing. And then a bit later, I'm going to tell them about Skeleton 9000 being revolutionary in terms of the technology it uses. And maybe people that really care about that are going to be like, oh, OK, it's sick. That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, I talk about my personal budget being small and us needing to have a short campaign cycle. I talked about that earlier as well. Um, I think from this, the other thing to consider is there are tactics you can use that aren't just buy my game. So a lot of indie devs do this really, really well. And I think that they just do it without even thinking, where it's like they build their own online persona and they build their own profile. Like, um, I can't even think of them right now. But the, the guy that always goes to Denny's, he just made a game. Who, who knows? Thank you. Yes, he's a legend. And he has a Twitter personality that is amazing and psychotic and uses it to kind of get people interested in his game before he's even talk, talked about his game. Um, and that's a valid strategy as well. You may not necessarily gel with that for yourself, so don't do it unless it's something that you think is cool. But there are strategies that you can use thinking about building up personalities without necessarily selling your game for the entire window. Um, something that I think is really important to note is the going viral. Um, again, it's a tactic, and it's one that I don't encourage. Like, sure, if shit goes viral, that's awesome. But it just 99.9% it, .9 of the time is not going to happen for you. And thinking about a, a sustained way of building a community and building you know, relevance and understanding about your game is going to be way better than banking on the fact that you make a TikTok that does really good. Um, we're up to the knee now. Um, <laughs> so this is where, when you had those insights about the people that are going to be like buying your game, become useful. For example, if I'm selling a game that's going to be appealing to, you know, really young girls that are really hyped about stuff that isn't even necessarily games, maybe I'm going to focus predominantly on TikTok. I'm not even going to look at the other windows. I think a lot of people will also look at Facebook. Um, I feel like this room, like I'm sensing a vibe that you all know that Facebook's like mostly dead except for paid advertising, right? I don't need to talk about it. Yeah, sick. Awesome. But understanding who's going to be buying your game and who's keen on your game is the best way for you to work out where you need to be talking. Because you can't be everywhere, especially when you're an indie. You, and you shouldn't. Like The biggest mistake I see indies make is going, we have to be on every channel, and we're going to do it. And threads just happen, and I don't even know what it's about, but we're going to set one off and start posting anyway. And it's just like, you're going to die. <laughs> Please don't. Please do not do that. You need to think about you know, the, the resources that you have, both from a time and a money perspective, and think about what's going to work best for the audience you're trying to get. Again, think about your marketing funnel. Think about awareness. What's going to help you with that awareness? Obviously, we know Steam is the best place for all of those things, but we can't control that majority of the time. What can we control outside of Steam? Reddit, Twitter. 
I would say Twitter's not as good as it looks like it is, and obviously much more quickly becoming very irrelevant. Even before that, though, it was it looks very, very relevant, but maybe not as relevant as TikTok, for example, YouTube. Um, it's going to be different for your game, and that's like the beauty of marketing. But you really need to consider these these things instead of just going, oh, we're going to do a post three times a week on every single platform. Psycho. <laughs> All right. So for this, you know, we want a high awareness strategy because we want this to be like trending. So we're going to focus on TikTok. We're not going to do billboards or cinema ads because <laughs> no one does that unless you've got like $700 million. Some people do, I guess. Um, it's all going to be digital. We're going to be like looking at specifically channels that spawn and disseminate all of the trending content. So obviously TikTok, obviously Reddit. You know, maybe for your particular game, it's going to be something different. All right. <laughs> I'm going to talk about skeleton analogy. It's going to be gone now, thank God. Um, I think that me talking about, like, oh, that's a tactic, that's not a strategy, I, I feel like sometimes people take away from that that I'm saying don't have tactics. Um, I, have no, I think tactics are awesome. They're just probably going to change on a weekly basis, especially when you're looking at a, a, a social media tactic in particular. I just feel like if you've only got a limited time and you can only do a, a little bit, you should be thinking about the bones and the, the thinking plan rather than the doing plan so that you can make more informed choices. So on that, if you have limited time and you can only do one of these things, you can't do the full who, what, when, where, why, I would suggest it, it may take you like a day, but if you don't have that and you're launching a game in two weeks, and you're like, good, good lord, I need to know how to market a game. Um, do the who. Understand who you're selling this game to. That's going to help inform all of the choices you make to a certain level. Um, it's going to inform the kind of content you're making. It's going to inform you know, even things like price point and things like that. It's, it's really going to help inform that stuff. Um, so yeah, I think from my perspective, the main takeaway here is Think about how you can make a strategy that can be pivoted, because I like you all. You need to survive. It's 2023. You're going to die if you keep trying to make tactics instead of plans. All right. It's question time. Did I do OK for time? Have we got time for questions? Hell yeah. Mm. We did it. Is this the microphone that people will use? I can just repeat it. Cool. We can do that. OK. Gentlemen over there. Uh, once you know some high level information about the audience and their preferences, how do you go about digging deeper and finding out more information, such as where they hang out? So there are a bunch of websites that like their entire um, the thing that they do, the product that they sell, is they can give you really good, insightful data into that stuff. Literally cannot remember them because, of course, I can't when I'm standing in front of a, a room of people and claim to know things. Um, but literally, even if you Google like marketing insight thing, <laughs> that's going to get you a, a really good Google search result. Um, <laughs> but I can definitely, once I've like thought about it in my brain, I'll tell you the ones that I use. That's the paid option, and when you don't, you can't do that. You don't have that ability. Honestly, immersion is the next best thing, and it's free. Um, living and understanding the communities and like sitting in a Discord and understanding what they're talking about, um, if they'll let you doing a survey to understand the insights of, of what kind of games they like, how do they play games, um, I found that we've done that a bunch with um, League of Geeks fans in general. We've been really open about it. It's like we want to make sure the game we're making resonates with you all and we want to make sure it does well. Please give us this information. You don't have to. And they're super forthcoming. Like, a lot of, especially when you're kind of collaborative, a lot of players will be like, hell yeah, I'll tell you everything you need to know because I need this game to work. Um, so I would say from a free perspective, if you're operating on a shoestring budget, finding where they are, immersing, immersing? Im <laughs> immersion, and then sitting there and, and understanding that from that perspective is really good. Um, there are often, especially if you're working in a genre that is established and you know the, the game's already there, a lot of particularly indie publishers will give information like that. So it's often like when I will start looking 
for um, insights to the kinds of players that we're going to try and market towards. Like, obviously, like I said, we've got two games, both strategy games, are very different vibes. So we've got Jump Light Odyssey, which is a colony sim set in the stars. It's beautiful. It's got anime. And then we've got another uh, strategy game that is a grand strategy game. It's a political grand strategy game set in hell. And both of them, both strategy, very, very different demographics. Luckily, with Solium Infernum, it had fans of the original. And so I just went in there and went, all right, who are these people? <laughs> How do they exist? Um, because this game, it's, it's awesome and completely foreign to me. And so from my perspective, I did the free version for League of Geeks. And it, to me, was just as effective, but I had less concrete insights. And so what I've had to do is know that my insights were assumptions and pivot when I'm given new information as opposed to being given like big data information, which you know, it's got its own issues. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Hello. Hello. Um, you made a comment at one point. You said Skeleton 9000 <laughs> was not going to be a community manager game. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear your explanation of that. What Absolutely. So Skeleton 9000 is a game, like I said, that shouldn't be made. Um, and aside from it being a little bit of a joke, part of the reason why I said that is it relies very much on being a fad game that's in the moment. Um, I don't even know what a business model would look like for a game like that, let alone what happens if the game's not successful. Um, the majority of games that I have worked on that have been successful have been successful because they have had a really dedicated, passionate, and advocate community that really, really care about making the game good. Because ultimately, and this is across any industry, the best way to get success out of a product that you're selling is word of mouth. And so in games, that's particularly the case. Like People often um, not, not buy games if they're you know, trending really, really badly in sentiment and if people are saying, like, talking shit about it. Um, similarly, particularly in communities like Reddit, they won't, they won't look at the advertising. Like, we literally have to make our advertising being like, we know you hate ads, but please play our game anyway. And it works, but what works better is someone else saying this game rules. And so a game like Skeleton 9000 is, is going to be a game that you're going to have to somehow make a community really quick for it. But because it's a trending fad type of game, why would these people care outside of the two weeks that they're going to play it while it's cool? Do you know what I mean? So I don't think anybody in this room is going to be making a game that's only based on a meme and nothing else and doesn't have fun mechanics or things going for it outside of that. So the, the, the concept of Skeleton was really poorly thought out by me. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Hello. Yes. Yeah, see, that's, that's a great question. And I think that five years ago, or even before I, I started working with indies as opposed to working in AAA, the answer that I would have given you to that question is immediately. You need to be developing your game with your audience in mind, and you need to be developing your game with, with the marketing strategy already known, because that's what they do in AAA, right? Like when they go through the process of greenlighting a game, the first thing they're thinking about is, what is this going to sell? How many copies is it going to sell? What is the projections of this game? And then they'll be like, okay, cool, you can start making it now. Like, sounds like it's going to make us a bajillion dollars. Um, I actually think that there is so much value to making a game that you love. And I think a lot of successful games, particularly indie games that do really well, they do really well because somebody has gone, this is something that is inside me. I want, it, I want to get it out. Like It's not so much them going, yeah, the audience are really going to love this. They're, they're going to all buy it. Um, I think that in a perfect world, we would have a meld of the two where you would have something that you want to make and you'd be really excited about it. You would have some design documents maybe and then you would sit down with whoever's doing your marketing. If that's yourself, it's a conversation with yourself and you would kind of think about what the, the commercial reality of that game would look like because that's going to help you make decisions like who you're hiring, how many people you're hiring, how, how you're going to spend your money because if it's a game that 
is something that you love and you're excited to make, but it's not going to be like a hugely successful game, that's, you can still have success if you're limiting your budget and you're thinking about that like from the beginning. Um, and so I think the only way you should be thinking about it during the development process is to have a realistic understanding of what your outcomes might look like. So you can be building those targets to go, this is what success looks like for me and this is how I'm going to achieve it. Does that make sense? Awesome. Hello. Um, so let's say you um, get to bank and you didn't build the audience for it. How as a marketer do you go out and find the audience that this new game is not out yet um, is going to attract? Um, the best way to work out an audience that you haven't thought of while you're making is to literally go talk to people. Um, there are so many people here. You could go, here's my game. What do you think about it? Like, do you like it? What, what kind of people do you think would play it? Um, obviously, if you can get it, places like PAX are amazing because then you can just be literally witnessing with your eyes who's connecting with it, who it's resonating with. Um, like I said again, like play, player surveys, things like that. One thing that um, I've learned in the past little while is both really, really incredible from a marketing perspective and get your game out there as well as understanding your players in a really great way is Nextfest demos. So if you have the capability to do it, putting a demo up on Nextfest is invaluable. You get so much insights, especially if you literally just go, hey, thanks for playing. Can you tell us what you think? And ask some demographic questions, ask what other games they like and things like that. And suddenly you'll have really, really robust insights and data. And it's not just you going, oh, I think, people who really like first-person shooters like this game. Um, so yeah, I, I, from, a, from a what's the easiest way to do it, literally just get in front of as many people as you can. Next first is a great one if you, if you can do it. There's one in a week. <laughs> I don't know. If you happen to have a demo, go for it. Who else? Hello. Hey, um, how might you differentiate feedback that might be genuine feedback that should be brought into development or that's not the prime Oh man, that's such a good question. Um, this is something that I think from a community, my, my background is community management and um, one of the things, one of the clutch things that a community manager can do is disseminate feedback from the lens of is this um, demonstrative of what everybody is saying or is this just one guy's opinion? Um, I think once you've done it for a while, you get a bit of a gut feel because you'll see like a pattern of feedback. You'll start to hear the same thing over and over again. Um, one thing that I really, really encourage developers when I'm working with them, if there is a community manager working in their teams, just stop fucking looking at the comments and let the community manager do it because you'll see one thing and maybe you were already worried about that one thing in your head and the, the, the bias that will happen was you just hone in on that. You're like, I'm going to change everything about this game. This person said the thing that I was worried about. And it was literally one guy. Um, so it's, a, it's an awesome question that I don't think there's a perfect answer to. If you do have the resources to have someone whose job it is to be that filter and like grab all that information, that's the most clutch thing. If you don't have those resources, what I would do is never act on a single piece of information. Make sure you're seeing it repeatedly. Look for patterns as opposed to individual pieces of data. Does that make sense? Awesome. That was a great question. It's, it's hard. <laughs> all right. We questions? Hello. Yeah. That's an amazing question as well. Um, so part of the benefit of identifying the different levels of players, so your core, your mid core, your mainstream, is so that you can keep it in mind when you're receiving the feedback. And so I know my question is a little bit of a like regurgitation of your your question, but realistically, if you're in your Discord, which is 
already going to be full of your core fans, let's face it, and you know they fit the player profile of your core and they're giving you inf information, insights and feedback that resonates with that audience, there's nothing wrong with taking it on board. There's nothing wrong with thinking about it. But you just always need to keep in your mind, OK, well, I'm looking at a, a whole subset of people here. What I would often say is, I know I've said it a few times already, but like feedback surveys are really helpful. Again, they do tend to capture the more um, engaged people. And so what I would try and think about is once you've got that understanding of the behavioral insights of the players that are more mainstream, think about them when you're making your decisions. Sometimes you'll be able to like change something about your game that is not going to fundamentally impact them, but it's going to make everyone else's in the core really happy. I think the hardest thing, and, and I've seen game, I've worked on games that have done this, where they've gone, all right, it's really important to listen to our community, and we're going to change the whole game based on that. And then suddenly they limit the commercial viability of their game down to just that core audience. And again, I come from a community management background. I love it when dev teams are like, hell yeah, we're going to listen to the community. But I think you always need to think about the big picture when you're thinking about that feedback. So yeah, I, I know to answer your question, I kind of just said, yeah, it's a good thing to think about that. Um, but realistically, it is one of those unknowns that you can never really know, because ultimately, those people it's, it's normally the, the most vocal 1% happiest and the 10% unhappiest that are ever going to actually talk to you. And so all of those people in the middle that are like, yeah, seems fine, I guess, they're probably never going to say anything. Um, and so having a good understanding in, your, in like your very soul of who you're making this game for is going to help you make those decisions. We've got five minutes left, apparently. So if you're planning on asking a question, hey. <laughs> um. So in your opinion, what would you say is the biggest pitfall with self-publishing for game developers, whether you're coming from a AAA yeah. background or you're doing your own very first startup? Yeah. What would you say is like the biggest thing that people just, they listen to all the advice, they, they go to a convention, then, yeah. and then they still make that same mistake? Totally. Uh, I know it's going to sound really funny for me to say the biggest pitfall is doing this shit, but it honestly is. This is the thing that drives me up the wall, is when people think about the tactical play and they think about marketing from the lens of we're going to do a post on Twitter and it's like yeah cool but why like what it, what are you actually trying to achieve what is the important thing here and I think a lot of particularly self-publishing indies they just don't have a lot of time and they go I'm just going to sit on Twitter because that's where I was anyway and wonder why their game doesn't take off when the audience that would love their game actually sit on YouTube or whatever like I think from my perspective that's the hardest thing it's like the thinking at the beginning because I think a lot of people that are creatives don't like to think about this shit it's like icky marketing like commercial business guy stuff and I think from my perspective, I think it's good to even just talk to people that do it for a living. A lot of marketers won't shut up once you start asking them questions about this shit. But also just, I think, not thinking about this stuff will cost you in the long run, even if it's a little bit of outlay in the first place. Um, so yeah, I know, I know that <laughs> the, the answer to your question was like, oh, the talk I just did is the most important thing. But it, it really is. It's the thing that frustrates me the most. So. Yeah, <laughs> does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Otherwise, we might call it here. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. <laughs>